This is Lucky the Freak trying to get this interview. It's your host, Lucky the Freak. That's Random TV. Um, so, I think since this is called Real Talk, I think it would be important to kind of just look at the history of policing and, like, how policing has started. And if you want to look at the history of policing, policing started as slavery patrol, you know? And so it was pretty much here as, okay, so we don't have slavery anymore and a means to, you know, you know, keep people in capture. So we're gonna look for different methods to kind of like, you know, arrest people. So that's where the black codes come in, where you pretty much could get just arrested for just being black, <laughs> like literally, like crossing the street while black, you know, like talking while black, being black. And so I think that if you look at the mistrust, the mistrust has um, ancestral roots, you know, to our ancestors. And the mistrust has history that's deeply embedded into our country. Um, so I think that has carried over today, you know, like even, oh, sorry. <laughs> Siri, nobody called for you. Um, um, and I think that that's something important to know. Um, a lot of the mistrust <coughs> comes from the actual history of how policing was found, especially in our country, which respect to slavery. Real talk. Okay. <laughs> Slavery aspect. Okay, went that far back. I'm going to fast forward because uh, I think a lot of us uh, are strong advocates of here about all our lives matter. All of our lives matter across this table as well. And um, our, our chief is Dexter Williams, and uh, our police department are a strong advocate when it comes down to 21st century policing. There are six pillars, and our first pillar of 21st century policing involves building trust and legitimacy. Um, I happen to have a relationship here working at the Miami Dade Police Department with the former director of uh, J.D. Patterson here, and as well with the current chief of Miami Gardens. And that's something that's important for this community here, Miramar, and right across Miami Gardens, had that same infants uh, of significance and how important we do when it comes down to our resources and how we talk and how we communicate. So what I'd like to do now is actually to turn it over to our major who oversees our community policing aspect of it when it comes down to our uh, community resource officers that are out there and all the uniform operations. And then at the same time, we can be followed by our other major who, who oversees everything when it comes down to school resource officers who are out there with the kids and the children and investigators as well. And that one-on-one -on -one contact where we have to build on our trust. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for having me. I think that this is such an awesome platform for us to have conversation. We started earlier with a conversation about um, why is there distrust? And I think it's because of the lack of communication. When there's a lack of communication, then we can expect to have miscommunication. So as my assistant chief said, I am in charge of all of operations. So all of the police officers that you see responding to calls for service here in Miramar, um, I'm fortunate to say that they are on my team and I am on their team. We consider ourselves to be a team and we are not necessarily focused on what has happened in the past. We recognize that. We are looking for solutions and how we can move forward. So I am pleased to report that our agency, we're really big on community policing, but not just traditional community policing as it started with Sir Robert Pill. Um, we've expanded on that. Um, just to give you a breakdown, our city is actually divided into 10 geographical zones. We have a community resource officer that is responsible for each and every zone. They are out in the community they network with the citizens in the community. They form relationships with the community. Not just the citizens and the residents, they also include the business owners as well. So they are the first line of defense. So if anyone doesn't feel safe, if they have an issue with a police officer, they have an issue with quality of life, it can be something as simple as um, a feral rooster, dog barking, neighbor dispute, parking complaint, we take those seriously and they can actually pick up a phone and call
call their community resource officer on a cell phone. They don't have to call 911. They don't have to call the non-emergency number, and we have a process in place to make sure that we address those calls. We also hold our officers accountable. If someone calls you, we expect for them to get a return phone call back. And the reason we do this is because we recognize that here in the city of Miramar, that in order for us to be effective, we have to have the trust of the community. We can't be a legitimate authority figure without having that trust. We get our, we get our legitimacy from the community. <coughs> if the community does not allow us to do our job, they do not lend that authority to us. We've seen it all over the nation. We then have a state of anarchy. So in order to prevent that, you have to get ahead of that and you have to be engaged with your community. And that includes the schools. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Major Dunkelberger now. Um, I think we also have another unique situation here in Broward County regarding our, our, our youth. And um, I will defer to him on that because that's the, um, that falls under his auspices. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Thank you, uh, first of all, for, for having us. We appreciate this opportunity uh, to be here and to be able to speak to you tonight and to do just this, engage the community and have these talks. Um, as my colleague said, I oversee the Special Operations Bureau, which consists of our school resource officers, our PAL program, our training division for all of our police officers and support staff, as well as our detective bureau, uh, the traffic motorcycle officers that are out there, um, to name a few things. But with, um, with that, as my colleague said, our school resource officers here in Miramar, we have a, an SRO in every school. We have 20 school resource officers to include the charter school. Um, our police chief, our commission, uh, has supported that for several years now. It is very important to us to engage in the community, to engage uh, all the students of all ages, uh, all the way from elementary school throughout the high schools as well. It's important for the children to know that the police officers are here for them and to build those relationships from the beginning. We have several after school programs with the Police Athletic League. Uh, during the summer, we also have Hanging with 5-0 program that we offer through a business partnership, through uh, the Anson business of the Park of Commerce, they've been supporting that. And that's for a, a program for at-risk youth that are identified by their school resource officers. And they spend that summer with our officers in that camp, going to various field trips, uh, the command staff, we go in there as well, spend time with the children, playing video games, kickball, going on field trips, and having just discussion. As my colleague also said, we have several community programs that we engage in, uh, fishing with the future with children where officers are just going out there and, and throwing a line in the water and then having some, some talk of anything that may come up to, to start that relationship. Just one more thing if I can continue to add. Uh, on the training side, all of our officers are required to go through annual training. And again, as my assistant chief mentioned, uh, we are uh, striving on the 21st century policing and uh, the pillars there, uh, which is definitely one of them that's extremely important, is continuing to educate our officers and our staff. And with that, uh, we're addressing deconfliction of incidents that uh, you may have already heard of that process and that training as well. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> I would say also another reason why there's mistrust between the police and the communities is because you can't show up to a community forum without your guns on. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, I would also say that if you look at the budget of so many cities and so many counties and so many municipalities, more of the money goes towards policing than it does towards education. Um, we don't need school resource officers in every single school. Uh, we, we don't need more police in school. Uh, what we need is more resources towards the actual education, towards counselors, towards restorative justice, towards all those types of things so that our kids can get the education that they need. Um, and despite the fact that we've talked to so many officers that believe that there's mistrust because of things that happen nationally, um, and what we're seeing on TV and YouTube videos and, and these murders that we're watching live, uh, there's a good amount of people that actually have negative interactions with the police. 
those interactions aren't manufactured. Those are folks that are trying to live their lives and be on their merry way. Um, and, and police are absolutely abusing their power because our country, our government has given police unfettered power uh, over our lives. Um, and then in those situations where something bad has happened and they call to complain, it's another issue for the person and not the officer. Uh, we rarely see for crimes where for crimes where the person actually lives to tell the story, uh, we rarely see the officers, well, for crimes that the person is killed, we rarely see that there's any type of discipline uh, that can happen uh, for officers. Um, and in another, another thing that I wanna bring up is in Florida, people think that we got palm trees and retirees and this is vacation land. Um, but in 2015, Florida led the country in the killing of unarmed black men by police. Um, so more than any other state, Florida, uh, and per capita, it was Hialeah, um, is, is killing our black men. Um, so that's something that we need to pay attention to in Florida, because how often do you see that in the news, number one, and how many of those officers have gone, seen any day in court at all uh, for what they've done? So that's why there's mistrust, because there's, there's truth uh, to our experiences, there's truth to our stories and our negative interactions with police. Um, they, we can't just pretend it's like, it's not a thing that we can just call a complaint line about. Um, and it's a trauma that lasts for generations, um, those, those experiences with police. <clears throat> So something was brought up, and I just really want to pose a quick question, because I know I see Elijah Manning, um, recent graduate of Broward County Public Schools, and some youth in here. Do you feel like more police officers in your schools make it safe? Not at all, actually, I was taught that middle and high school. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, I know, I know, you, you go, I'm not trying to derail. So I just wanted to ask that quick question, because we want to hear exactly from the people who are the most impacted in the room about how they feel about um, police officers being in their schools. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to be very brief as well because I think the question was what about the disconnect? What caused the disconnect? I think even sometime in forums like this, the disconnect does seem to get bigger because of the statements that are used. But I really do think this is the greatest disconnect. We're not talking from the same sheet of music. We understand as law enforcement leaders that there are situations that come up where we need to hear and listen to each other. And that's what this forum is about. And I say that because an officer every day, every day, goes out and sees some of the most horrific things in the world, every day. And I'm not saying what we're gonna talk about is not horrific, cause it is as well, but we have to be empathetic enough with each other to hear each other. The honors of being first. I can take up a lot of time. I was actually at Miramar High School about two weeks ago, and I seen about four officers, four officers at Miramar High School, and honestly, it looked like a SWAT team at that school, and I don't think that's safe. The students I spoke to at that school told me uh, that scares them, and if that scares our children, that's not good for our schools, because what example is that showing the community? Not a good one. That there's officers there to jack you up if you get out of hand possibly lock you in the back of a police car, things we don't need in our school at all. And we should get rid of SROs. Yeah, we're gonna keep uh, going with the audience right now. We have another comment right here. Um, this is for Major James. You said there's training for officers at the school. When they pick up students and fling them on the ground or they hold a student, like say you arrest a child from the school and you spend 24 hours, you don't contact their parents. That's a part of the training?
I get it, they've done a crime, but are they human? Uh, do we have anyone else that wants to respond to that on the panel? Okay, we have uh, Major Smith. Good evening again. Um, I wanted to respond to, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't catch your name. Elijah, hi. Um, I wanted to respond to your comment about um, school resource officers in the school. Um, most people think that school resource officers are there as, um, as a safety mechanism. And um, certainly they are there for safety. But also, um, we talked about communication and breaking the barriers. And we want the officers to be in the school so that they can actually engage with the youth, not to be there just to arrest them, throw them down, uh, use force against them. At Miramar High School, um, one of the programs that our police department actually funds is a criminal justice program. And I'm not sure if many of you are aware of that. We actually pay for a teacher. And she teaches a criminal justice program. And um, I'm not sure how many students are actually enrolled, but um, they have quite a few. And if they go through this program, um, which is a three-year program, at the end of the three-year program, they can actually come out with a certificate to get gainful employment as a community service aid. So they actually come out with the skill. And our police department actually pays for that. So it's not um, just for the purpose of safety. That is one prong of it. But that's not the only prong of having a school resource officer. And I know that some here, and you guys have expressed it, uh, that we don't need school resource officers um, in the school. But some of the parents, they have a difference of opinion. And they like the, the resource officers in the school. So we try to find the balance. And sometimes it's hard to do that, but we do that by trying to listen and again, be empathetic to both sides. Thank you. So I think when we talk about disconnect uh, communication problems, trust problems, we have Elijah stood up, he's in high school, he just graduated high school. Different people in the community are in high school or have people, family, friends in high school. And if they say we don't want school resource officers in the schools, we're not being heard. So he says he doesn't want school resource officers in the school. The officers are going to say, oh, they're there for this and we have these programs here for this and that. But they're still not asking us and they're not, they're not listening to what, we're, what our requests are. If we don't want them in the school, then talk to us about why we don't want them and get an actual feel as to who wants the school resource officers there and who doesn't. So if we find one parent that says they want school resource officers in the schools, and majority of the parents don't want the school resource officers in the schools, are we gonna listen to the one parent or are we gonna listen to the majority of the people? I, can we get a, a room temperature check as to who wants school resource officers in the schools? Just, and who doesn't? At least it's 60 40. At least. So we should at least be talking about whether we should have these school resource officers in the schools. Normally, when there's police in, in different institutions, whether it's our communities or it's our schools, and they're there occupying those, those spaces, like military units, there's usually problems. They're there facilitating the school to prison pipeline, they're there facilitating the war on drugs. So, the more, if you keep putting more police, like it just seems like a, a math equation. You put more police there, it seems like more people are going to prison, more people are getting in trouble. It, it just doesn't seem like it makes sense to keep adding police to schools, adding programs to schools that nobody asked for. So I think if we're talking about communication and trust, we have to actually listen to the, these people that are in front of you and then you take it back to them, or take it back to your officers, your departments, and you talk about what we can, what you all can do to fix the problems. Um, just to build on what you said, I think um, we all want the same thing, right? More safety in our schools, right? I think that that's the root cause of why people chose to answer, yes, I want more policing in my schools, or no. Um, but I think what people don't really realize is what are the alternatives to policing, right? Um, so I'm also a trained 
Restorative Justice Circle Keeper. And restorative justice is a community, non-punitive approach to handling conflict. So I'm gonna repeat that again. It's a community, non-punitive approach to handling conflict. Um, restorative justice is ancestral. It's what our ancestors did, you know? It's indigenous. It's what the indigenous people whose land that we're occupying right now did, you know? And so when we talk about how we actually think about different methods to safety, let's talk about restorative justice. Let's talk about how do we actually resolve the conflict. Suspending the student, all they're gonna do is just go home. They're gonna go home, probably play a video game, be added to the school to prison pipeline, you know, just be funneled into it. Um, but restorative justice is like, how do we actually seek restoration? Because we know when somebody commits a harm, that they didn't only commit a harm to the person that they did it to, but they did they committed a harm to the community. You know, so it's like, how do we restore the community and rehabilitate people? Because we know when people enter the criminal justice system, they don't come out rehabilitated. They actually come out ready to commit more crimes because the criminal justice system is broken. It doesn't work. And actually, I'm lying. It does work in the exact way that it was built to be operated, which is to funnel more black and brown people that look like the majority of us in this audience to be right back into it. Because we know when people go into the criminal justice system, 98% of military um, equipment is built by, for free for, by prisoners in jail. You know, So a lot of corporations have contracts with prison systems to use free labor of our black and brown bodies while we're in jail. So. It's, it's working as it was designed, which is to keep most of us locked up. Um, so how do we actually discuss the real solutions, which restorative justice, it does what it says. It restores people, it restores communities. So I think if people have more information and knowledge to the alternatives to policing, then we could have a real discussion on like, how do we actually keep um, our schools safe and our, um, our children safe while they're in schools? My only concern is when you ask a question, context matters. I think there was a police shooting, but not a police shooting, there was a school shooting this week in California, right, a couple of days ago. If you think about mass shootings that have happened in our country, not necessarily here, a lot of them have happened in schools. So if you talk about placing school resource officers, just general like it was presented, you can see the answer. But if you think about it in the context of this country in which we live, where mass shootings seem to be happening every 10 days or every 30 days, something like that, I think it's every 10 days. If you think about it from that perspective, I bet you the answer would be. Yeah. Um, I
people. Um, and then that way they won't be afraid to interact with police whenever they see them. And maybe some of these police officers that seem to be afraid of most of the black people they come in contact with will be able to see them as human beings instead of um, as criminals. shame we only get 30 seconds to, to talk because <laughs> there's so much to say um, what comes to mind to me is empathy and reaction and something that I would press not just to our panelists and law enforcement uh, and not just to the audience but society as a whole is that society is really really bad humanity is really bad at empathy and reaction right what it comes down to is the fact that very rarely do we ever actually try to see things from the other side, right? So we immediately, one, the first wrong thing to do is to pick a side, and then the second wrong thing to do is not to identify what that side struggles and reasoning is for it. Now there are plenty of reasons to distrust whatever the opposition is, because fear stimmies that distrust. But from that lack of empathy, what we get is overreaction or complacency, which is just as bad. And what happens is you have instances where police officers do abuse that power. And you have instances where the public does abuse that trust that police officers place in them. I'm not gonna say that any one side has more responsibility for the other. Uh, but what I do believe is that it is incumbent upon all of us, if we're going to be going forward, to make changes in our society. It is fair to ask police to change their demeanor, their behavior, and the way they police. That is 100% fair, and I would never take that away from anybody to express that. It is also fair for society to make changes themselves. Um, the way you interact with not just law enforcement, but any situation that you come into contact with, when you decide to react without the thought process of how that other person is perceiving your actions, you've already failed in your encounter. You might get so lucky as to have come up with the right solution, but it was not based on a rationale that is that is wholesale to society. It was based on your simple logic. And if you think in that vacuum, if you think in that bubble, you will always have instances where we have officers who overreact and citizens who fail to do the right thing. And however, the, however minute on both sides that may be, you will always have those instances. Um, I wanted to press a, a question to the law enforcement officials here. What do you do about overreaction? Because to me, that seems to be the, the, the biggest problem. Um, what do you do when an officer has overreacted? Because to me, I don't think the laws are necessarily the problem. I think it's how strictly we enforce them. I, I, I believe it was Tiffany who made the point about um, what kind of measures we can take outside of punitive ones. And I, I'm a very strong advocate of, you know, not relying on initial, you know, not relying, relying on punitive measures to be the first response to something. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, allow the panel to address this question before we come back for commentary. What we're gonna do, we're gonna start there and just pass it along so we're not skipping across. Well, every situation is different. It's based on what happens. But one of the main things is it, it, it comes from the top down. You gotta make sure that proper training is installed in everybody that works on the police department. And yes, you're gonna have good and bad in everything. You have some good officers and you have some bad officers. The media likes to promote a lot of the things that are the bad and not the good. And there's a lot of good officers out there. So first of all, we have to investigate what happens and we have to deal with it accordingly. You have a vast range of things that happen. It could be from you bringing the person in, the person getting written up. It depends on what happens. It depends on the person getting terminated, and that has happened on occasion. But that doesn't get shown a lot of times when the person gets terminated, or there's some officers that do get arrested, but that doesn't get shown also. So there's a vast range of what happens to the person. But the number one thing is you gotta make sure that the leadership is right and that you educate the person and you allow your personnel to know exactly what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing out there. Also, we have to have proactive leadership. I'm the type of person, I don't stay in my four walls. My assistant chief, majors, don't stay in the four walls. So we have to go out there and proactively supervise. 
we cannot go ahead and allow our individuals to go ahead and supervise themselves. Therefore, they don't know when we're gonna go out there, but we go out there and we observe what they do. And if they do something wrong, it's up to us to go ahead and say, no, you're not supposed to do this, and correct that behavior. Whatever the range is, it's appropriate. You have to make sure that you're fair and in balance in everything that you do. And we address everything that comes to us. If something comes to me, I address it appropriately, and they know exactly the type of leader that I am. So um, that's my standpoint with it. I think um, we have to, when you say we have to look at both sides, and I believe we do, I am a strong component of parent teaching as well. And a lot of times our kids can learn from what we do at home. It goes out into the street. So I can just tell you an example in my home when I was raising my children. Respect is due to a dog. Respect is due. Now police officers are trained to do one thing and we have to respect that. We don't know how they're trained. They go through an academy. We don't know what that training consists of. But I can tell you in the city of Miami Gardens, we had a citizen's academy. They showed us what the police actually do. They showed us how they talk to their dogs, how the dogs are trained, every piece of the police side of what they do. To me, it was interesting. It was some things that they showed us that I never knew. But I can tell you I've had my problems as well. I was stopped in Opelika just driving behind a police officer. And he just pulled over and he said I was following him too close. And he was very ugly. He gave me a ticket. But that's what I'm saying. Each, each response and each situation that we go through is different. It's just like I'm a parent. I want policing in the schools. And I can tell you, I live in the Norland area. And going down the street just to pick up kids from Norland, I saw boys kissing boys, girls kissing girls. I saw a fight break out. The officer was right there. It was behind him because they had already left. But I went up to the officer. There's a fight down the street. He immediately turned around and went to handle that. We have gangs in every community. I can tell you about Miami Gardens because I live there. But we have gangs. And because a student might have moved from Norland over to another street, that in itself can cause a problem. I think communication is still it. We have to understand where the police officers come from, and they're out there to protect and serve. There are bad cops everywhere. And those that are bad, we need to make them leave. We need to have situations where they have to go. I mean, you can look at some of these things. What, this is my last point. My son is a police officer. The day he took that job, I went on my knees, and I tell you, I'm still there. He just got to become a detective last year. I'm still praying every day. Every shooting, every whatever, call, I call him. And I say, what do you think about this? He's a very level-headed kid. But he said a lot of it is perception. And a lot of it is emotion. And then when you go into emotional decision, I mean, when you go into emotions, it's hard to make a great decision when you're emotional. Am I correct? Can you understand that part? That's, that's how it happened. And we talked about a shooting that had just occurred, and he told me it was a bad shoot. But then he knows. They talk about it, they deal with it, and things have to be done. But we can't come together when something goes wrong. We have to stay on the field to fight. We have to, it, it, we just, I've noticed that our communities, a lot of times we're not engaged until it comes to us. We have community forums that go on that the room is not even full. But then the moment something happens, we got the streets all blocked up, signs up, and we're screaming. We have to change what we do as citizens. It's horrible out here today. But we have to change what we do, and we meet them where they are, just like they can meet us where we are.